understand how a God so divine could lower himself to a life such as mine and consider me worth every minute of time to rescue a sinner like me. When I think of my Savior alone on that cross, I know without Him that my soul would be lost if He had not been willing to suffer the cost to rescue a sinner like me. To rescue a sinner like me, Lord, to rescue a sinner like me. He abandoned his throne and his kingdom above to rescue a sinner like me. that I could not see that the reason he died and arose just for me so unworthy was I yet he came willingly to rescue a sinner like me to rescue Thank you for that. Let's stand together and turn to Philippians chapter 1 this evening. And thank you for your faithfulness in coming to uh, Sunday night service. Philippians chapter 1, we'll read verses number 6 through verse number 11. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6. Verse number 6 is the verse we looked at last week, and then we're looking at verses 7 through 11 tonight. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, 
that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, insomuch both as both in my bonds and in defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense, Till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. And let's pray. Father, we do thank you for loving us. We thank you for this evening. I pray that in these few minutes we have together that you would speak to us through your word, Lord. Help us to experience the joy in our life that you want us to experience because we know Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Of course, we've the last couple weeks we've we've started looking in the book of Philippians. And the theme of Philippians is is joy. God wants us to have joy in our life. The the book talks about it. Six times the word joy is used, eight times the, the word rejoice is used. And so Paul, who is writing in the midst of an imprisonment was writing to this church and saying that he wants them to have joy. Just because Paul was in prison, although that's not the best thing, and although that's not his choice, he was still saying, in these circumstances, I can have joy, and you can have joy. And at the time the New Testament was written, most Christians were either experiencing or they were going to experience persecution. But still, Paul is saying, we can have joy. As I have mentioned, and I'm trying to get in our minds as we go through this, and joy is not some kind of, of liberal concept. Okay, to, to be a joyful Christian, if you want to call it happy, as long as we understand that, that, that joy or happiness, if we use that word, is not dependent on circumstances or happenings. It's dependent upon the Lord, but God wants his people to have joy. It is all throughout the Bible. The fact of the matter is, if you ask the average person, and you ask them, what do you want out of life? They may mention some things, but really, behind it all, they'll tell you, I just want to be happy. I just want to have joy. By the way, if, if that's what everybody is ser ser searching for, Maybe God put that inside of us, but there's a problem. We're sinful creatures, and, and we got off the track, and so we try to find it in all the wrong places. We search everywhere, and we never find it. Joy is something you really don't have to search for. It's something you find as a result of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Think of it as a think of salvation as it is a gift and it's a package. And when you open that package of salvation, inside of there's another gift and it's the gift of joy. Now you can have true and right joy because you know the Lord Jesus Christ. But we look for it in all the wrong wrong places. Charles Spurgeon said this: as there is more heat closest to the sun so there is more happiness nearest to Christ. Closer we would get to the sun, the more we would feel the heat. Well, the closer we get to the Lord Jesus Christ, the more we experience joy in our life. If that is true, then the opposite is true. The farther we go from God or the more we allow ourselves to get caught up in sin, the farther we are taking ourselves away from joy. If we understood that, we would know that every sin we commit, every shortcoming we allow ourselves to display or we get ourselves involved with is nothing more than trying to find joy in a godless substitute. Now you think about that. We're trying to find joy somewhere we were never supposed to find joy. Fact of the matter is, it's almost a replacement for God and the fact of the matter is, it's nothing more than an idol and we're never going to find joy there. It's not just the unsafe people are trying to find joy outside of God. It's God's people. You think about this. 
every time we are tempted to sin, in that moment when we're thinking about it, we are deciding whether greater joy can be found apart from God. And if we really think that greater joy can be found apart from God, then we will give in to the temptation. But if we would only understand what the Bible says and we understand joy comes from him, then we would understand whatever that sin is, whatever that temptation is, it's a false substitute and we wouldn't give in to it. God wants us to have joy. We seek joy in thousands of places, but really there's only one place it is. It's in God. And so the first couple weeks, we've looked at that. We, we talked the first week about how joy is found in the church. We talked about the people of the church and, and, and that. And then last week, we found that, co- that joyful Christians are confident Christians. We looked at that in verse 6. Tonight, I want you to see how Paul's joy was seen in the way he had a real heart and real care for the people in the church there. Paul's joy went beyond the confidence he had in them that we looked at last week. We think that joy is found primarily in the care of ourselves. But joy is really found when we step outside of ourselves and we really care about others. And for those of us that are saved, that is God's people. Our society is more selfish than ever. And and conversely, if you think about it, we're more miserable than ever. We're keeping psychologists in business. Uh, We're running around. Look, people don't even know what gender they are anymore. You know why? They're unhappy. I I haven't listened to him in years, but I used to listen to a guy, Michael Savage, many years ago. And he was talking about people having these gender changes. He says, listen, and, and he's not even Christian. He says, they're just miserable people. He goes, and they can change their gender, but you know what they're going to find out when they change their gender? They're still miserable. We used to go to a seminar many, many years ago, and, and, and they, they talked about the unchangeable features. And I thought, you know, that's nice, and I get it. We're supposed to be happy with who we are because we can't change ourselves. But that was many years ago, Brother Charter. But at, as time is going on, I'm seeing how much more important that really is. That's why a guy all of a sudden wants to like a guy. Why? He's not happy and he thinks he'll find happiness there and and our sinful flesh leads them that direction. We're always looking for something somewhere else and it's not there. It's in God. And we need to find that out. We need to be happy with who we are. Okay? God made us a certain way. and, And joy is found in following God's path and being who he made you to be. I'm getting off kilter here, but let's get back. So Paul had joy in the way that he cared for this church. In the verses I read, we're going to notice two areas tonight. We won't be long. I want you to notice, first of all, joy, he, he, he shows his care for them and his passionate plea for them. That's verses 7 and 8. I want you to understand something about Paul before we move on. Paul faced a lot of persecution. Paul faced a lot of hard times. I'm going to read you some verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul's talking about himself. He says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. And labor's more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths off. Of the Jews, five times I received, uh, received I 40 stripes, save one. Five different times he was hit by the, the greatest amount mandated by their law, 39 stripes. By the way, that was not a good thing. He did that for the Lord. Thrice, verse 25 of of 2 Corinthians says, Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Not like some of you were stoned. Okay, so so don't think of that. Throwing rocks, being beat with rocks, okay? Thank you, Brother Rawl, because I was thinking of you when I saw that. He says, Thrice I I suffered shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep and water. And journeys often. In perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me, the care of all the churches. 
So he mentions all this stuff that he was being persecuted and he was being put down for. In that last verse, really, he says, in, all the, in the care of all the churches. That, that was a small one, but that's a big one too. All the stuff he had to deal with, with the churches he had started and the Christians and the infighting. He says, I have all this upon me. Listen, Paul didn't have it very easy. Paul didn't have it very easy. But you know what was a comfort to him? The people in the churches that he, God allowed him to have a hand in helping. That were a blessing to him and an encouragement. And Paul could always look back on that with fond remembrance despite all the turmoil that he had to go through. Yes, he had God's comfort, but he had these people. In his plea for them, he mentions several ways that he had those emotions for him, for them. He mentions firstly that he had them in his mind. Verse 7 says, even as it is meet for me to think of you all. We saw a couple weeks ago how he had already remembered them with thanksgiving. Christians should be a source of encouragement to each other. And it ought to be such a blessing to be with each other that even when we're away and we think of them in our mind, we're still blessed. Let me ask you this question. When's the last time you were a blessing to someone? Have you ever went through a difficult time? If you've ever went through a difficult time, when you come to church and you're around God's people, I guarantee it's encouragement. It's an encouragement. By the way, I used to hear this, that we used to have to listen to a radio show from, from we were in Bible college, and, and it was, uh, once a week, it was, the church had a radio show. And the, la- the, the pastor would always say this phrase at the end, be, be kind to everybody, because everybody's having a tough time. I don't know how often I'm around here and I'll just see somebody and say, hey, how are you doing? And I'll ask about something. And then they'll release a little bit of a burden. People need encouragement. They, 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 listen, that, that's what the church is for, exhorting one another. And Paul said, I have you on my mind because you're an encouragement. See, you don't understand. Some little small thing you do for somebody, you don't understand how that can help them. You don't understand how long that might, that, that might be something they hold on to. Let's be an encouragement to one another. And I know you invite people to church as you do it, as we all do. Sometimes like, well, I'm not going to church because, and they'll tell you the horror story. I used to go to a church over here. Uh, last Sunday I was talking to someone, said, and they told me something horrific that happened to them in a church many, many years ago. And I'm, and I'm like, look, that person wasn't right, but not everybody's like that. Okay, not everybody's like that. I hope when people come to our church, and I hear it on a pretty regular basis, so I'm sure it's true, that they say your people are encouragement. But Paul said, I have you in my mind, you're a blessing. And then he also says, they weren't just in his mind, they were in his heart. He says, because I have you in my heart. Sometimes someone can be on our minds without them being in our heart. Someone can say, well, that person's not on my mind and they're not on my heart, but they sure are my nerves, right? (laughs) But listen, we ought to have an emotional attachment. There ought to be a love for God's people. Paul had an emotional attachment. Now, I will say this. Emotions are very funny things because they're kind of up and down. And for some people, they're more upper and more downer, okay? Okay. They're all over the map. I always say, emotions are a great passenger on the bus as long as they don't drive. Okay, don't let your emotions drive your life. But you know what? Emotions are a good thing. There ought to be something about God's people that we love. Think about it. We are, if you're saved, we are all, we are all connected together in a family relationship. We all have the the same father. We're part of the same family. We ought to like each other. Now, if you have children, you know your children don't always get along with each other, right? The other night, uh, we were in the room, and my wife, she she laid down. She went to sleep. I was reading, and and it was uh, was about 11. The boys had just got back from the tournament, and I went out, and they were a little bit loud. I'm like, it's 11 o'clock, man. They need to go to bed. Okay, so I went out there. I'm like, they're going to bed. I go out there, and the four, the four of them, the girls and the boys, they're all sitting out there talking, laughing, having a good time. I'm like, what are you guys doing? It's bedtime. And Jack, Jack I think it was Jack, said, brother, we're brothers. Don't you want us to get along? Don't you want us to love each other? Something like that. I'm like, do it somewhere else. It's late. 
And then next thing you know, I'm out there for, with them for about 20 minutes talking. I'm like, hey, it's bedtime. So they all went to the room and started talking. You go to your room and talk. I'm going to bed. I just don't want to hear you outside of my room. Amen? But, but we're, in the same, why, why, we're in the same family. We ought to love each other and get along with each other. By the way, that's one of the most powerful testimonies to the fact that Jesus Christ is real when they say people getting along because they have the same family. Paul said that he didn't just have them in his mind and in his heart, but in his life. Look at, look at the, the end of the verse, uh, verse uh, 7. In so much as both in my bonds and in defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. He said, you're a part of what is going on in my life. And he mentions two different areas there where they are a part of his life. By the way, love always works itself out in actions. If we have someone in our heart, we have someone in our mind, and they're not on our nerves, we're going to do things for them. That's just how it works out. That's the family of God. Okay? The Bible tells us is to do good to each other, especially those of the household of faith. That's going to happen. And Paul mentions two areas that these people were in this verse that they were partakers. Listen, he says, and much as both in my bonds. He's talking about when he was in prison. Now, we'll see later, we, we alluded to it, but the Philippian church sent a, a, Epaphroditus with a gift to take to Paul while he was prison to help meet his needs. Their prisons were not like the prisons of our days. In prisons of our day, you have, a, you know, you have cable tell all this nonsense. Many years ago, I, when, when I was going to say Brother Obama, no, he's not a brother. Uh, Pre, uh, President Obama, when he was, he helped fund and they built this jail in, 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 uh, in um, um, was it Indiana or Illinois? I think it's Illinois. And it, it looks like, a, it's, it's beautiful. It looks like a hotel. I'm sure it's not a hotel, but it's like, what a waste of money. Listen, when you were in jail there, you didn't get fed. People had to take care of you or you died. And this church found out, knew Paul was in jail, and they sent why he was in prison to take care of his needs. They were a part of his life. By the way, we need to be a part of each other's life in the church. Very important that we help each other out. You know, I'll greet you. How you doing, brother? Thanks for being here. Hey, can you help me move on Saturday? How you doing, brother? Thanks for being here. Say, I need help moving. I'll call Brother Machardo. He'll get the Filipino department. They love to move people, don't they? No, come on. Sometimes you got to step outside of that and do something for each other. I know, you know, well, you know, that person took advantage of I, 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 We're not talking about that. We don't mind being a blessing to somebody as long as it doesn't cost us anything, right? I'll do anything for you. No time, you know, that's, you got to be very careful what you say. Is there anything I could do for you? And, I'll, and I say that, it's not phony, but, you know, you'll text somebody or write them a nice note. Hey, you did this thing. If there's anything in the church we could ever do for you, be very careful. Say, well, since you brought it up, okay. But, hey, if they're a brother and sister in Christ, ought we not to be able to help them? They were a blessing in his life while he was in prison and in his preaching. He says, and in defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partake. They were with them. Man, when he was out preaching the gospel and he was out doing the work of God, they were with him and they were behind him in his life. And, praise the Lord, even when he wasn't doing so well and he's in prison, they were still there for him. You care for someone, you're a part of their life. And then, they says he was just part in his desires for them. Verse 8, he says, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't sound very exciting, but that's just their way. That's where they thought, that's where in that time the seat of the emotions was, the bowels. So say, listen, I have an affection for you. By the way, I can see why he would. These people were with him. They were spot on when he was doing his work. They were right there. When he's in jail, they're right there. And he says, I have a desire to be with God's people. One of the blessings that most church members miss out on are the blessings of each other. And God's given us each other. If there is a unity, you know, unity comes behind having the same beliefs and having the same goal and working together. And so let's not miss out on that blessing. And let me say this, and this is a message for another day. 
as uh, those of us here, we're on a Sunday night, we're a little farther along in our Christian walk as we've been thinking about all uh, Christian growth. You know what new Christians really need? They need other Christians in the church to come up and put an arm around them and say, and just help them out. You know, you look at the book of Acts, Brother Pineda, they, people were saved, they were baptized, they were added to the church, and then they continued in fellowship. But see, their fellowship was not just, uh, and by the way, I love fellowships. Last summer we had all the different Sunday school classes over on a Friday night. We had a good time. We're going to do it again this year. And my family liked it. But that's fellowship, but this was a deeper fellowship in doctrine and other things. You know what it was? It was when these new believers were added to the church, other believers were coming up behind them and, and, and taking them, by, taking them uh, just grabbing onto them, helping them go forward in their Christian life. You know, you don't need a pastoral uh, uh, privilege to, for a new couple in your class to, that, that just got saved to take them out and, and, and encourage them in the Lord. I'm so glad people did that for me. I, was, I came to the church as a 17-year-old, and the assistant pastor, Dave Sisson, who I wasn't in the Sunday school class, I wasn't anything. He took, a, he took an interest in me after church because I'd play basketball, and he'd go out after church and play basketball. We'd play one-on-one, -on -one and, and, you know, he was in his 30s. I was 18. I could play ball. I, could, I couldn't outshoot the guy. The guy was good. But he just spent time. He took me out soul winning for the first time. He just took an interest and helped me in my faith. And I can think of other people in that church, the guy that ran the bookstore. I went back there, and I'd buy tapes, and he'd start talking to me and say, hey, you know, Steve, here's a book you ought to read. He wasn't my Sunday school teacher. He just took an interest. And boy, that's what we need in the church, right? We see that. Number two, we saw this, his, his passionate plea for them. And then number two, and we'll be done in a few minutes, I want you to see his purposeful prayer. Purposeful prayer. By the way, don't those two go together? If you care for somebody, won't you pray for them? You pray for your family? You ought to pray for your church. Okay? Someone has a need, you put them on the prayer list. Why? Well, it's just a natural outflow of caring. The people that you see out in the world, you know, you go, you go to them. Uh, I, there's this, um, this basketball player, Monty, do you know his last name? His wife died. Monty, I don't think it's, Williams, Monty Williams. How many of you know that, about that story? His wife died in a car wreck. When we were home the other night, I was checking the Clipper score. Hoping they would lose. But just checking the Clipper score. And it was halftime, and, and I, I had it on right when they were playing. This guy's a Christian. Now, I'm not into these celebrity Christians. I'm not. I'm not. And, and this guy isn't us, I'm sure, but he was, he was solid. How many of you saw that? Anybody see that, that clip? That was incredible. He got up at his wife's funeral, and he was hardcore for the Lord. Somebody hit his wife head on and really killed her. The lady was going about 90 when she hit her. And this guy got up and said, don't you quit, don't you just pray for me. He goes, there were two people that killed. That other family needs you to pray for them. He goes, and I hold no ill will against them. But it's funny. After they got done with that clip, and it was powerful. I don't prop these guys up very often, but it was powerful. But after that clip, they went back to the three guys sitting there, and Charles Barkley's one of them. And they all just sat there and didn't say a word. They were like, Finally, Barkley, who's got a big mouth, said, I got nothing to say. He goes, he's a far better man than I am. Well, of course they got nothing to say. They don't have the Lord. Now, those of us that know the Lord, if someone's going through something like that, we have something to say. We're praying for you. We're praying for God's grace for you. But the world doesn't have that. They have no idea how to handle problems. They don't. They, they, at the la they just, how do you handle that? But as Christians, this is the place. And Paul says, listen, I'm praying for you. Now, there are some very specific things in this prayer. They're very, very good. Paul said, listen, I'll do everything I can for you, but there's only some things you need to get from God, and I'm praying that you get those things from God. What are they? Well, here they are. First of all, he said, abounding in love. Verse 9, and this I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in judgment. Paul wanted them to have love, but he didn't want them just to have love. He wanted them to have the right kind of love. See, Christianity does not understand love. We think we know love, but we don't. 
there's a very weak understanding of what love really is. And Paul had it right here. He nailed it. He wanted their love to abound to be more and more. It's not that baby love that's just a, a warm feeling. Like the first time you saw your wife, it's like, wow, she is cute. I want to be around her. And it's like, oh, it's that puppy nonsense. But as that love grows deeper and deeper and deeper, it's more than that. It's a love that sticks through thick and thin. She gets thicker, your hair gets thinner. <laughs> Just kidding. Thin hair is a sign of God's blessing. I don't care what you say. The more brain you have, the less hair you can handle. Okay? But no, it's a, it's a love that's not that puppy nonsense. It's a love that's that, that, that just, I'm in this. And it's deep and it's abiding. And Paul says, you need that deep love. The right kind of love. Someone is, we, sometimes we see somebody and they're in an unhealthy relationship or someone and it's like, they're not right for each other. And you know what we say? Love is what? Blind. In some cases, it's deaf and dumb too. Okay? Love is blind. Can I just tell you something? I'm going to just tell you this. And, and I, the kind of Christian love that's promoted in our churches today is, is blind. And it's deaf and it's dumb. And it's not scriptural. See, he's going to tell you what love is. And people, won't like, people most Christians won't like this. He's, he goes, I want your love to abound yet more in, first thing there, knowledge. Well, wait a minute. I thought love's a feeling. No, there needs to be some knowledge behind that feeling. So I love that girl. I think she's the best thing in the world. I want her. She's an axe murderer. Go the other direction. She has 75 boyfriends. No, but I love her. Okay, you have love without knowledge. Love cannot just be on its own. See, there has to be a boundary on love. There has to be a limit on, there has to be fences around love. You know what those fences are? Knowledge. That's what he tells them. Knowledge is something you can know precisely. See, without knowledge, we can't even understand love. Love is limited, and it's, it's limitless in its application, but it has limits in its acceptance. We need to understand that. Love isn't just some, well, I just love, and by the way, you, we love unconditionally. I get that. But there has to be some boundaries on it and how it's acted out. Love must be governed by truth and knowledge or love will be permissive. I love my children so much, I'm just going gonna, gonna to let them do whatever they want. I would contend that if you let your children do whatever they want, you're not really showing love to them. Letting a little four-year-old run your household, that isn't going to happen. Now, I love our grandchildren, all of them. Four years old, Charlie's two, and we got two of them that are one, and we have one being born this week. And I love them, but when they come to my house, they ain't just doing what they want. You know, they'll run around sometimes. And, you know, children, they get a little, and finally say, hey, quit yelling, quit screaming. Grandpa doesn't like to hear that. Okay? But, you know, um, now my wife, she lets them do whatever she wants. Okay? Go play with the knives. That's fine. <laughs> Just kidding, babe. <laughs> no. Listen, I love my children when they were growing up. That's why I didn't let them do some things that were hurtful. That's love. Our society is so, and Christianity is like that now. We, Jesus just loves you, man. It's all about the love of God. Do whatever you want because Jesus is your best friend. Listen, Jesus said a lot of things they wouldn't like. But love. You know what we do? We love the Jesus that says, neither do I condemn thee. And we want to ignore the other phrase. Go and sin no more. He said, listen, I understand a lady that was caught in adultery. I understand you were set up, and I understand they were trying to set me up. And I'm not going to condemn you just like the other guys that set you up didn't condemn you. But don't go sin, don't go sin anymore. You forget, go. You know, those two, that's love. Love isn't, you're saved now, go do what you want. Love is, you're saved now, I have abundant life for you. Get into his word. Love's not this gooey, do-whatever-you-want stuff. But it's in knowledge, but there's another part, though, and in judgment. 
Do you know what judgment is? Literally, it means moral discernment in ethical matters. That's judgment. Love is discerning in what is right and what is wrong. We love all people, but that doesn't mean we have to love what they do. And it doesn't mean we don't get up and say, the Bible says that's wrong. Sorry about that. Now, here we go. Here's Christian's answer to that. Brother, don't judge. Judge not. See, we want a Christian that says, God loves me. I can do whatever I want. And if someone gets up and says, hey, the Bible says this is wrong, it's like, don't judge me, bro. That is utter garbage and nonsense. That is not what the Bible means when it's saying judge not. And Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are those which judge you. I'm not judging you. I'm telling you what the Bible says. And God loves you too much to let you get away with what you're doing. That's not love. Listen, I, we could get up here. I'm just telling you. We could get up here. We'll change the music, Brother Pichardo. We'll have a bunch of, of, a bunch of immoral-looking people standing up here singing a bunch of garbage. And you say, why do you get on the music? I don't know. I just, I just like to. It's, it's garbage. I, I was checking on something this week, Brother Pineda, so I checked on the Contemporary Christian Top 20. A little shout-out to K-Love. They had the words and the artists on there. So I went there, and I looked. It's a bunch of junk. I looked at the words, and it's like, where's Jesus' name? Let's all go to the river. Listen, I love to go to the river, but when I go to the river, I'm going fishing. And that song didn't say anything about fishing. But it's just a bunch of nonsense. Ooh, baby, baby. I could take one of those songs. I could sit with my wife, candlelight table. And I could sing her one of those songs. We're going to the river. And she'd like, ooh, he's being romantic. No, that's a contemporary Christian music, top 20. And by the way, and this isn't about Christian. I'm sorry. I don't know how this happened. But, but by the way, those artists, they don't look like Christians. You say, that's not, you're judging them. I'm, maybe I am. That's okay. And I'll tell you what, most of them, if you take the time to check their doctrine, and I've checked some of their doctrine, it's not Christian doctrine. They don't even believe in salvation by faith. Okay? And y'all, and, and I'm just throwing this one out since I'm in a kind of a foul mood right now, so pray for me. Don't be listening to that hillside garbage. Uh, hill song. I say hillside. Okay, let's back up. Hill song. That, can I just tell you something? If they believe that doctrine, that's not salvation. And you know what kind of Christians they produce? Justin Bieber Christianity. That guy was at their pastor's conference. He's their, he's their convert. Can I just tell you something? I don't want that kind of Christianity. You say you're judging them. No. I can judge what they believe by the word of God. It's not Christian doctrine. And it's not Christian living. Now, let's go back to the, everything was so good, that first point. I'm so sorry we backed off of that. But judge, listen, I'm just saying this. I can love people, and by the way, and you know what? If Justin Bieber was here right now, um, I'd probably be jealous of his hair. I'm not sure. <laughs> I would be kind and nice to the guy, and I'd talk to him about the Lord, but he is not my hero. Okay? And it's wrong. What, what his lifestyle and everything he's doing is wrong. Why? It's, it's, I'm just, the Bible tells us what's right and wrong. Let's not just fall for this. Let's just get up and sing about love every Sunday. Well, I, was, I know I was with all that. Now I forgot. Thank you, Steve. Well, you're, you're welcome. We're talking about you could change the music, and we could just get up here and have positive messages. God wants you to love yourself. Oh, people would eat that garbage up. Okay? You know how you love yourself? Love God and love others because that's best for you. Okay. Um, what else did Paul pray for them for? Next, discernment in excellence. Look at verse 10. He says that ye may approve things that are excellent. Approve means to examine or test. He says everything that you're faced with in your life, give it a test. Don't just buy into it because Joel Osteen said this is good. Don't just buy into it because your buddy says this works for him. You've got to prove it. Put it through a test. Is it really going to be what's best for me? 
Approve things that are excellent. Most people settle, settle for mediocre in their lives, right? You know, I'll settle for down here when God says, why in the world would you settle for down here when I got something up here for you? That's what we do. Excellence becomes acceptable in our life. Then acceptable becomes adequate. And adequate really is just medio mediocre. There are things that are best for us. And Paul says, put them to the test and take that which is best. Look, I like pasta. Canned spaghetti is not pasta. Now, I'll be honest with you, and I haven't had a can of this in years and years and years. But I have a fond remembrance. SpaghettiOs. Come on now. The neat little spaghetti you can eat with a spoon. Okay, how many of you have ever had a can of SpaghettiOs? Man, I'll just be honest with you. I don't know if it's the poison they put on, but they're pretty good. But it's not better than, than, than fresh-made pasta. Right? You, look, when you go to Olive Garden, they're not throwing you SpaghettiOs. You said it's pretty close? Wow. I want, a, I want a hamburger that don't go to McDonald's. That's not meat. Anything that melts in the sun cannot be meat. <laughs> now, if I want a hamburger, I'm going to go to a hamburger joint, right? A place that it's on. We settle for stuff that's not excellent. We lower our own bar. It's not good. You got to ask the question, not what, you know, here's a baby question. Well, what's wrong with it? Well, let's study the Bible and find out. But here's two questions. What's right about it? And is it best for me? Is it, the, is it God's best? Prove those things. Don't settle. Christians have settled for second best. And then he says, continue in, in sincerity. Verse 10 again. That you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. The word sincere is, has two meanings. They would use it to, they, what they would do is when they sold pottery in those days, the pottery could crack. And so what they would do is they would fill in the pottery cracks with wax and then paint it up to make it look like it was, it was right. Sincere means, with that, really literally means without wax or without wax in the sunlight. So, so, and what people would, if they wanted to find out if it was really sincere, they would take it outside in the sunlight so they could really tell what it was made of. And if you put wax out in the heat, guess what happens? It starts to get soft and melt. He said, listen, be genuine. Be sincere. Be right. Because you, you don't want to be a fake. And we're supposed to be sincere. We're supposed to be genuine and right without offense. Sincerity that is also right. So we have two options. It is possible to be wrong and sincere, right? Right? We can be sincere and with offense, we can be wrong. Or we can be right, but we can be insincere. Paul says you need to get both of these things right. It's like a man who has a headache and he goes to the cabinet. He's very sincere in wanting to get the right thing for himself, but if he were to grab something that was poisonous, his, sin his sincerity isn't going to keep him from getting worse or dying. He's got to be, he's got to grab the right thing. And Paul tells us, let's be genuine. Let's be in, in, our, in our beliefs and in our actions. Well, how do we do that? It has to be tied to that which is right and correct. It goes back to the love and knowledge and judgment. And then he tells us we're to be fruitful in our righteousness. Verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory of and praise of God. What are the fruits of righteousness? It's those qualities in our life that are a result of our conversion to Christ. That's what that is. When we got saved and the Spirit of God starts to dwell in us, and we start to get in the Bible, and we try to learn what the Lord wants, and we start to grow in our faith, what happens is, naturally, we start to change in our life. Things happen. You know, that, that's the fruits of righteousness. God is developing that fruit inside of us, and it's a fruit that everybody can see around us. It comes, which, how, how do we get that? They come from Jesus Christ. By the way, it's not just producing results by ourselves. I'm going to get this done no matter what. That, that's great, but you need some power behind that. We can only do so much on our own. We want to live in the flesh. I'm just going to do it by willpower. Willpower only takes you so far. 
You want to be transformed permanently, you need the Spirit of God. He says it's by Jesus Christ. It's received from Christ being in us. When Jesus Christ lives in us, the fruits are going to match who we are. The Bible does say you, can, you, you're not, you, you judge things by the fruit. You shall know them by their what? Fruits. Not if they're perfect, but are they genuine? Are they sincere? Do they have the right kind of love? Listen, if you're a Christian, it's pretty obvious. It'll be pretty obvious to others. There's something different about you. And it's not who you are. It's who he is in you. You say, well, nobody ever mistakes me for a Christian. We need to work on that, don't we? We need to make sure we're connected to Jesus Christ as he tells us in John 15. We're connected to the vine, we're the branches, and we have the power for God to do something in our lives. And Paul prayed that that process would continue in them. That God, Look at Christianity ought to be everything to us. It ought to dominate everything in our lives. It's not just something we add to who we are. You know, I'm a, uh, you know, Brother Pichardo, I'm a Filipino. That's great. I'm a, I work at the church. Great. I do this. I drive a Ford, so I have a walk a lot of time. Okay, that's great. And, and, oh, yeah, and also I have Jesus. Great. And I'm a Democrat. You vote for Hillary? I didn't think so. Good. No, it's not just adding it. Brother Pineda, you know, I'm white. He thinks he's white. He's not. Uh, you know, and, and, and I like the Dodgers. And I like the Lakers. And I like every other team that's losing, okay? Uh, you might as well like the Rams because they're going to lose too, right? Okay. I got the T-shirt already. It says Los Angeles Rams. I'm in. But, okay, so, and, and, oh, I'll add Jesus to all this stuff. No, you don't add Jesus to it. Jesus is who you are. And so we're Christians. We're Christians 24-7. And that's going to dominate every part of our life for the good, not for the bad. Quit. you gotta, you got to throw that false thinking away. Well, that, that's why, oh, if you're a Christian man, you got to serve God and, and you put the hammer down and you get her done and you're not happy. That's garbage. People ought to look at you and say, why in the world are you so full of joy? I'll tell you why. By the way, your light's not shining if you look like you got run over by a semi-truck. Oh, I'm saved. Well, you know what? Stay away from me. That might be contagious. No, they ought to look at you and say, there's something different about you. You know what that difference is? I know Jesus Christ. I know him. And that dominates my whole life. And Paul prayed all these things for them. Let's stand this evening.